Hello, I'm John Day. I work at the Fred Hutch and uh, support scientific computing there. Um, it's kind of new in America, land acknowledgement. The Fred Hutch acknowledges that the land that the center is on belongs to the Salish peoples, and it, the waters that touch that belong to the tribes of the Duwamish, Tualops, Suquamish, Tualop, and Muckleshoot nations. Uh, we've been using EasyBuild since about 2015, and it's really influenced how we design our computer now. And we've made a decision several years ago that everything will be deployed with LMOD and build with easy build. Of course, there's some exceptions. Um, move this out of my way. We're a, a cancer research center. And recently in the last year, we've changed, uh, we've merged with a, a clinic. So we've dropped the word research out of our name. So, but we do have patients now on site. Uh, we do sequencing. We have 300 principal investigators. And in a, I guess that's a term used in Canada and the US. So a PI is somebody who has runs a grant. And some of these PIs are just individuals. Some of them have staffs of 50 to 100 people. We also have a lot of graduate students. We also have a lot of postdocs on campus. Uh, Fred Hutch is home to three Nobel laureates. Um, and the Hutch has been the home of uh, Gettleman was at the Hutch for eight years. Uh, also bioconductor started there. So there's a big legacy at the Hutch of using R. Um, I'm just throwing this up there. It's just kind of a demonstration of some of the scientific work that's done. Uh, Trevor Bedford, this is an, a, a complete map, a uh, phylogenetic tree map of uh, COVID-19. And this data is also geolocated. So you can zoom in around the world and see where it is. And this is an interactive graphic that's on a website. So you can zoom in and get incredible detail down to the individual samples, or it's just a fun slide. I like to put it on there. And again, uh, we're actually developing cancer cures at the Fred Hutch. And this is just, again, I just love this graphic. So it's uh, T cells attacking a uh, cancer cell. After listening to all these amazing supercomputers at the conference, I'm never gonna use the word HPC again. I'm gonna just call it scientific computing. But bioinformatics has very little to do with, with HPC. Um, and again, when we deployed our new cluster, you know, easy build and the software stack became so important that now we deploy our nodes at just the absolute bare minimum. It's just truly an Ubuntu that just right out of the box, hardly anything's added to it. There's no dev packages. If you type make, it says command not found. It's just a core that, that for running jobs. So everyone needs to load their software at the start of their job. <clears throat> um, and there's no, since there's no development tools, uh, and we rarely get complaints about this. People don't develop software like GCC, like you would see at other supercomputing sites. Uh, and rarely when that comes up, we just say module load false, and then they have all the tools they need. Some of the trends we're seeing is uh, increased GPU usage. Three years ago, we had no GPUs, and now we have one GPU per node, and it's creating some interesting problems in the sense of you start a hundred or so jobs that require GPUs, your job runs on every single node um, since there's only one per node. And the other problem we're seeing is uh, we bought consumer grade GPUs just to just try it out, put them out there. Maybe people will start to use them. And they have uh, with eight gigs, it's not sufficient to build models. So we do have some PIs who've gone out and bought the A100s and fully maxed out on memory. So building models requires lots of memory is what we're learning. Uh, we don't see too much case of just people using them in general computational sensors. Uh, PyTorch is probably one of our big, and of course, AlphaFold is uh, <clears throat> Uh, one of our new applications that people are very interested in. And of course, the request for modules just continues to grow. Uh, when I started at the Hutch, we might've gotten one request once or twice a month. Now there's several a week and it's really daunting. Uh, and the quality of bioinformatics software, I, I just hate to say this on a recording, but it's really terrible. 
Um, something I like to do, I've started using Elasticsearch and Splunk many years ago, and uh, I'm certain everyone does this with their site package Lua, but I like to do the key value and uh, some of the other things that we monitor. I, I try to actually obey completely like uh, JSON rules. So, uh, and the other thing I like to do is pick up, and I've got this off the web somewhere, but the job ID. So if you're running a cluster job, it's in your environment. You can pick that up with Lua, with LMOD, and actually inject that straight into Elasticsearch. So if someone has a ticket and they're saying my job doesn't run, it, it's often difficult to ask them what they're doing. And we can just go into Splunk, type a query, and we can see everything that they've loaded. So we can associate all of those packages with the job. So it helps us out a lot and debugging and working with users. And you can see, so again, since I have all this stuff streamed uh, into uh, Elasticsearch, um, I can get amazing uh, metrics out of who's using what down to individuals. And uh, you can see that we're very heavy on R. FHR is Fred Hutch R, and I'll talk about that in a minute. R Studio is certainly growing. Um, and then things like BCF tools, I think that number is so high because it's being run out of our laboratory. So there's just processes that people are running from instruments that stream into our cluster. So every time a laboratory process runs, these things get run. And the R usage is really high also because you know people will use just a single function. They'll just, they'll just use it to grab a column of data out of something in a, in a job. So they'll load this huge software stack to do something that most of us would find some very simple way to do. Uh, I just want to share this. Uh, a couple of years ago, scientific computing, we decided there's only about seven or eight of us on the staff. We volunteer one hour a week to write documentation. And it, uh, it seems like a small commitment, but after two or three years, we have a, a very valuable resource now. We're partnering with the data science group Scientific computing is us in the middle, and also this a group called Hutch Data Core, and the people who do the run all the instruments are sequencers and things like that, the, the source of the data. Um, and this is public, you can find this online. Uh, it's shared everywhere. So part of how this is coming about too, as we get help desk tickets, you know, when you get the same one three or four times, you just think like we need to write better documentation. And so there's just that constant feedback from our users as you know, people don't understand how to do something or why things break, continue to document that. And then this is also a great resource for uh, postdocs, people who just walk onto the campus for the first time, try to use our resources. So it's a good entry point for users and it's, we've been really successful with this. I really liked Simon's talk uh, the other day. We really need to make R smaller and Python smaller. So, uh, I'd really encourage, these are just like really kind of glossy overviews, but so we have FH Python, Fred Hutch Python and Fred Hutch R. And these have grown from user requests. So every time I get a request for a package, you know, use the base R and we extend Fred Hutch R. So those are Fred Hutch R is very bioinformatics focused. It's this giant collection of requests that people have given us over the years. So we continue to maintain that. Uh, although in the last two years, the number of requests are just too high. We're starting to push back and we've documented that in the SciWiki. So please load your own modules, use a virtual environment or something like that unless it's a case where there's um, compiled C code or libraries or something difficult, and then we'll help you out. And we'll add that into the, into the base. And our Python is way too large. It's, it's just gotta get smaller. And I would volunteer to help with that. Both Pran and uh, PyPy have document strings in there. So I'm gonna run through with a little, I'll tweak easy update to print out those descriptions. I mean, it doesn't have the word science in it. It's gonna end up on the cutting room floor. Just try to edit some of that stuff out. <laughs> yes, I can, I, I understand. So, Again, these are you know what we're doing at the Hutch to support this, and it's it certainly does help us to just use the community R and the community Python. I strongly encourage that. 
and just you know try to build your own versions of these instead of extending the community version. Uh, R is wonderful. Uh, it's it's run by CI. It's not uncommon for a new version of R to come out and actually see packages drop off because it didn't build. Uh, sometimes I have to wait a week or so for people to patch their code because our scientists want those packages, but they're not available. They literally delete them if you don't pass. You have to. It, the stuff has to run. So, and sometimes I've patched it for other people because it's so important. I'll, I'll do the patch for them, get it submitted, get it back in the CRAN, and then build, uh, build R, the newest version. Um, and the easy update code for R is super stable. I haven't touched it in years. It just seems to work. PyPy, I just, this is what I can say uh, uh, on a recording, but it's, uh, you know, if anyone can help me or has any ideas about how to make it better, I'm I'm at my wit's end. It's uh, just going to PyPy. It seems like the only method to really be effective is to just build, like, you know, start up a little container, try to install it. But the time and energy to do that would be enormous to figure out all the dependencies. Uh, right now, I think it's really only good. Well, my easy update code is really only good for going to PyPy, looking at your old version and writing the new version in there. The dependency resolution is, is really difficult because it's not well enough annotated. Um, and it, it just as a community too, I think it's time for the scientific community to just say like, you know, this has got to get better. It's, it's really... To have a quick remark to this, there is actually a way to figure out dependencies of Python packages before installing them. It's not through PyPy directly, but there's a, there's a website called libraries.io which tracks PyPy, which tracks CRAN, which tracks CPAN, a whole bunch of sites like this. And they have a way of actually listing all the dependencies on that page. And it has an API you can talk to and get all that information now. So oh, not by talking to PyPy directly, but talking mm. to another website that somehow harvests uh, that information. I'm not sure how they do it or how reliable it is, but it does list dependencies there. Excellent. In a way that's easy to, to parse. I'll, I'll start on that Monday. <laughs> Uh, and I, I just threw this together uh, just as a quick example, like uh, when, of people who are trying to build new easy configs that have anything to do with uh, extensions lists. Um, if you just get a request from a user for a name, just just put it in here and just put an X. Uh, easy update. It's just parsing it. If it'll go out, it'll it'll find the new version, and it's not going to match, so it'll write the the new one in there. It's not like just save yourself the time of like going and doing it manually. Um, and in the last year, I've had to change easy updates. So now I have flags like update R or update Python. Uh, early on in the code, I used to try to open up the easy config and figure out what language it is. And that was easy at first to do that. Um, you know, it either had the word Python or R in it. But uh, that's so unreliable now and so difficult. And the way easy configs are written now, that's uh, I've just decided just implicitly say what you're trying to do. And then the code will, will go to the right section now. Um, this is a, a slide I recycled from a few years ago, but, um, and I think I have an open issue. And I think the person is in this room that opened that. Um, the reason why, well, when you start to update all the extensions lists, you'll notice the first thing I have to do is read your easy config and look at those dependencies because there'll be extension lists and those dependencies. So I need to discover all that and I recursively open every file. So, you know, Python has PyBind and I open every single file, every dependency try to extract every single extensions list and build a list of that first. So I'm not repeating something that's in another file. So I actually look for the string easy config, like it needs to be either in the directory I'm running in or, or I need to discover it through where your easy build is installed. So I need to resolve all that dependencies and where your libraries are. You might have libraries that are local to you that aren't in the, in the main repo. So I look, where we are in situ and also the installed base. So it's it's good to have the latest version of easy build installed. Make sure you have the latest versions of all the easy configs to resolve all these dependencies. 
And then I go out to PyPy or CRAN and start to look at all those little version numbers and update them. Um, and you can see, uh, I try to, this one's highlighted. Um, config parser is a dependency from uh, entry points. So try to annotate that, like where are these things coming from? And something I could easily add to the code is this idea of building a dependency tree. It's like a dot file, like it's done. And that would, that would be very telling too, to see you know, how this looks like. And if I had that information, that would also help your parallel build. So you could just find the right place in the tree and then just parallelize that in the build. Uh, just a couple of observations about easy config. Um, for me, submitting easy configs, uh, some of the bioinformatics code is, I mean, I don't know, like, it's just, how could I, how could I submit this? I mean, the recursive gets uh, stuff all over the place or, or there's a directory where they've hard coded, like, yeah, it's just, it's just so ugly and difficult. I don't, and sometimes I have to cheat. I just have to do a few things by hand or I make my own tarball by hand or, and then I put it in our sources directory. Um, and then from there, the easy config will work. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes easy, easy build is filled with patches, but most people are fixing the make files. Sometimes I'm actually fixing the end users code. And so, I'll take that and I'll actually try to push it upstream and then I'll immediately start using it on the site, but I'll also wait for it to come back and then re update the easy config. So sometimes that process can take months and months and then I lose track of it and I forget. And uh, so much of the bioinformatics code, again, it's just like a Python script. So it, it seems odd to, to add that to the, to the community. Um, and about Conda, I mean, often I go to these bioinformatics pages and it will just say that the only way to install it is Conda. They don't offer an alternative. So I would be encouraging people when you see that, especially once they've got an easy config port to go back and issue a PR against the original software to update their documentation and say, you can also install this with easy build. So, um, and I'm just gonna say, Containers have also been a sticky point. Like all of our users in bioinformatics want them. And I've, I think like, like that day is kind of come and gone for easy build. Um, all my users now just go to bio containers and they just grab these things. But it was still, uh, used to, I, I, I've spent a lot of time trying to use easy build to put software in a container. And I, I've just not been very good at it. Um, and it's kind of a lost cause. I mean, no one's no one asks me for containers anymore. We were so unsuccessful for it that people just go out and find them. They just go to the internet, they Google, they find a container and they start using it. They don't care how optimized it is, how well it's compiled, what the target is. If it works, they use it. So, and uh, I left out some slides. I should have talked about um, EBCB. So we build all of our software in a container. And the method I do to do that, I use a, a multi-stage build with Docker. So you need build essentials to build easy build and you need it to build boss. And that sucks in all the stuff you don't want. So I make easy build with one single line. So it comes out of one layer in the container and then I build a second container and I just grab that one volume and I put it in there. So my finished build container has no build tools. It has no dev tools. It has no libraries. Uh, if you type make, it says command not found. If you type GCC, it says command not found. It, it literally just has easy build and the FOSS tool chain and just one FOSS tool chain. And then from there, you know, you can build software in a, a clean room has been demonstrated some other talks here. And I, I think it's worth documenting to community because reading the email list, I mean, you see a lot of issues that would be solved if people were uh, always using a consistent environment, always using a, like a container or, or clean room to build their software. And so I think as a community, maybe, you know, standardizing on things like that too would uh, help to build better software. And again, like going back to how we built our cluster. So that's all circular. 
Um, you know, our build container looks a lot like our cluster node. You know, we try to like have everything stripped out and it really, really needs to run with easy build first, you know, before we put it out there. So that's, thank you. Okay, it should be, Simon, can you check if you can hear this small mic as well? <clears throat> yeah, so one, one follow-up question on, on the, the container that you're using. You're saying you're kicking out everything, but EasyBuild does assume it can find stuff like make and patch in the OS or in the build environment. So are you injecting that back in somehow or? Um, because currently we, we don't, we never list make as a build dependency for stuff. We just assume it's there. Assume it's there. Uh, I, I'll have to look at my recipe. Yeah. But I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't add any build essentials back in. And Ubuntu, I know with CentOS and Red Hat, make is there. Yeah. But it, it's not in Ubuntu. I, I think I do something to in, inject it, or it might end up in FOSS as a side, side effect. Oh, there is a, there is actually a, an issue that was open on this this morning. One more question for you, Kenneth. Is there um, uh, is there a reason why Make is special? Because all the other build tools are like CMake, Meson, Ninja. They're all build dependencies. But can you make it's just because it's a slow moving target. It, it's always there and it it never breaks. So I I've never run into a build problem that was because we were using the wrong version of Make. I don't think I've ever seen that. For, there is one, there's examples like this, yeah, okay. One, maybe. Um, there is actually one example where we have to build Make because that software requires a particular version of Make. I fell over that. Don't ask me, I have no idea. So the, I think there's one or two cases where we do include a newer version of Make as a build dependency, but usually we don't have to. For CMake, it's very different. It breaks breaks all if you try your being smart and using a new version, you're taking a big risk. And that's why we really include it everywhere as a build dependency. We don't assume it's there. And if it's there, we're not going to use it because we don't, we don't control that version. So that's, I think, a big difference. Now, that said, we should probably still add it as a build dependency and have our own control version of it and then maybe limit some of the, the problems that we see. Same thing for patch. If you want to take it very far, same thing from tar. Unzip, gzip, bzip, all these things were just silently assuming it's there in the US. And there's actually one change that Simon mentioned in EasyBuild 5. Right now, we're unzipping the source star vault before we load the build dependencies. You need to flip that around to actually be able to build all bzip, unpack the sources. And that's, that's one change we're going to make in EasyBuild 5. Just, uh, that, that wasn't, let's say, a historical mistake. Yeah, I, I really like the remark about uh, documenting better, like what you do with containers because it's something we don't use and I think it's actually the better way to do it. Uh, it also makes me think, and again, this is more a general remark, like if we do this in our easy build uh, testing environment as well. I don't, I don't think we do right now, right? So it would be good if at least one of the test systems would test with a very minimal container and then you know, even people who write in these topics who don't do the minimal build container, it's, it will be difficult to get that out to everybody, right? Some people it's just too difficult. But even then, if they make a contribution, we'll at least see it in the test environment and we'll see, oh, this particular package, this particular build dependency is mixed. Uh, you can find EBCB, which is a kind of a, a pun on GBCB, easy build container build. Uh, it's, it's out there on the Fred Hutch GitHub site. And I've extracted all of our user IDs. So I have the, an idea, there's a EB underscore user. And so in the, any individual site, you would just map that to whatever UID you have locally that, that owns your software. So as long, you just do that through uh, the Docker environment variables and it should work for anyone. Of course, mine is Ubuntu and you're, everyone will want to change that. <laughs> We actually made a step in that direction. So we had a similar discussion at the last virtual Easy Build user meeting. And the, the couple of weeks after that, we started puzzling together container recipes and building them with 
you'll have to think building them with Singularity or Obtainer and uploading them to the GitHub container registry. So now you can just do Singularity shell or Singularity run and that drops you into one of these containers. So we're actually, we've done some work on that already. We have a bunch of containers for different versions of CentOS, different versions of Fedora, different versions of Ubuntu. So we have like a dozen or so different containers. And right now it's only one per OS version, but we could have a minimal, like a, a clean room kind of thing. And then a fat one that even has stuff like Boost and and and, and things like this in, installed. Because sometimes stuff breaks because you have Boost in the OS, right? So it's not only about testing in a clean room, but it's also about testing in, in a fat environment. And and that may sometimes raise different problems that you, you want to get uh, you want to get rid of. Having CMake in your OS. And it's, uh, it's saved me too. Sometimes when you need to build a package that's four years old, that, you know, the fact that I have a collection of these containers now that go back to like uh, probably fall 2019. So I can just pull that container out, uh, you know, build in that, even though it's like really out of date or 2018 and create something that works without having to find an old OS or try to re, you know, get those tools again. So it's nice having, uh, when you do it for years, you end up with a nice list of containers that you can go back to if you have to. One of the things I've noticed is uh, containers are popping up with in terms of installation on a regular base in the last three days or so. I mean, we are using it last night. I had to chat about how to do it and so on. So maybe it might be quite a good idea to basically have a container working group. I'm pretty sure somebody who is cleverer than me can put up a much better name. I'm not good in PR. Um, I only open pull requests. Um, so we, we basically, we come okay. together and we share what is the best practice. And, and so we have a more or less, I don't want to say standardized way forward because that will not work, but we have a most common approach to how to install software on an HPC cluster. So it is actually working, documenting, documenting it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. sense. And that, that was, was sort of the idea with the, the easy build containers, containers that we have in the central repository. I think that could be a starting point and see what is there and how we can sort of leverage, leverage it the best and what can be changed or improved on top of that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Sam? Sure. Yeah. It's not about the logo. It's not about the logo. It's okay. <laughs> no logo. No. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware, but there's actually a script in the EasyBuild repo that is able to fetch all the Python packages that you will need, but it uses another approach. So it, what it does is you have to first load all the dependencies and then it will start a virtual environment and actually uh, install all your packages uh, with pip in this virtual environment. And then it will know exactly which uh, which dependencies are actually all needed and it will give you a list at the end so maybe you should you should check it out i'll have to follow up on that is that that's just in the framework or is it an extra it's, it's an, isolated isolated script. an isolated script and ah it's from uh, flamefire uh, alexander yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The downside of that is it can be very slow right because people actually have to download everything and actually install it and right. at the end, they're just going to throw that away because you all only want those version numbers. Right. And, and like you said, it, there's no way of getting that straight out of tip. They have 100,000 different ways of, of specifying dependencies in Python, requirements, setup.py, pyproject.toml, probably a whole bunch of others. And there's just no way you can, you can figure all that out. And I've been looking for a tool that just, if you have an unpacked Python package, Darbol, source Darbol, a tool that can tell me directly, like, these are the dependencies that I, I will need. I haven't found anything because it's just such a mess to, to look at all these files. So I haven't checked what libraries.io do, but that information seems to be there. And with a snap of a finger, you can get it. But we should check how reliable it is or how they actually figure that out. Maybe they do do installations and then just yeah, if you're, keep track of that. If they do it, we can just harvest the data. Yeah. yeah, if somebody's already done the hard work of opening it up, installing it, and then documenting that. Mm -hmm. And then you're still relying on on how accurate the metadata is, because there there are, let's say, scientists out there. I don't want to call them bioinformaticians, but they usually are, who write Python software 
and they don't even bother to specify the dependencies in any, in any meaningful way. They just do import, and if the import break, you install the missing packages. But because they, they it installs actually... perfectly on their laptop. Yeah, it already for has... them. They, they have their virtual environment where everything is, and yeah. it just works fine. Yeah. It wouldn't occur to them to, to yeah. so know for, that there's... We yeah. would still run into trouble left and right, but if those are the exceptions, yeah, we just manually deal with those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you very much, John. Thank you.